yeah i think i'm going to start talking about the lecture material now so um so that's cool so let's move on and um look about the look at the lecture material i'm going to go here and i'm kind of kind of fly through it because i'll tell you guys this stuff is not on the exam so but you got to watch me do it because it's it's interesting information and it's good to know and it's a lot of terminology that you need to know and um you're gonna i'm not gonna be quizzing you on this stuff so i'm gonna su suggest to you you know what take this and download it click on this click on that download that go over here click on this download this dude and download this this is really powerful information download this, this is the re reverse circuit challenge um actually i don't have oh let's see if this is still here yeah dude you know what that's awesome this is a reverse circuit challenge this is another really cool but let's take a look at this guys i this is a challenge that you guys could do i used to give chocolates away in my class and students could do this but what i want you to do is for week 14 i want you to um be able to come into class and actually uh, not class whatever just in week 14 you can show this in um in the lecture to everybody and you can show your circuit so what i want you to do is take this and print it and then actually hook up like you'll have to print it a couple times or you can do a screenshot of it and then whatever and then you have to fill in the value so this is a 12 volt relay it's a 12 volt motor hint hint they're both 12 volts that's kind of important there's a switch here this is single pole um double throw so if you throw it this way number two connects to number four if you throw it this way number two connects to number one here's a 12 oh by the way yeah hint hint 12 volts 12 volts 12 volts they're all 12 volts there is a way that you can do this so that when you put it in the middle the motor stops when you put it over here the motor goes one way when you put it over there the motor goes another way with only one relay yeah it's quite a challenge so it's a really cool challenge and it's actually a lot of fun to try and figure this out i actually had a lot of fun trying to figure this out um years ago this was a challenge that i kind of gave myself and my friends when i was studying motor control way back when so um this is kind of cool so i've been giving to this i've been giving my students this challenge for like 20 years and i've i've come up with i've seen all kinds of interesting ways that people do this but it can be done so if you do that i'm not going to give you like any chocolates because i wish i could like i, I was bring your chocolates to my class and i pass them to people that get it but just we'll give you a shout out like you rock you're awesome uh, and then I'll, actually no i'll give you like an extra 10 percent on your course yeah that's pretty good yeah, no, no, it's not gonna happen. Um, anyway, there you go. Um, five, yeah, no, 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 no. Anyway, just it'll just be good. It's it's a challenge for you, dude. Like, you know, just bring it on, and uh, it's a good learning experience. And do it for yourself, and that'd be great. Um, anyway, this motor control PDF is, I think, the same. Do you know what? This is an excerpt from the. Um, I use this actually to design the uh, motor control assignment. So uh, don't miss a motor control challenge, which is here. So that's interesting. So what I'm saying is, dude, you know what? We're going to look into this and we're going to look at this. These are amazing things. So what I'm saying to you before we jump into this stuff is you should you should download everything you could possibly download from this uh, course before it disappears, because this is an enormous amount of material in here. Uh, and then you'll have it forever. Like put it. I don't know, print it out, put it in a book, or I guess nobody does that anymore. Um, put put it somewhere so that you have that information as you go back to it. So this information here is great stuff. And let's just go over this. So I want to talk to you about industrial controls. I um yeah, awesome. I'm so pleased that you have a hard drive full of lectures. Um that's awesome, dude. That's just that is the way to go. Good for you. So let's go over here. I already pulled this up. Let's talk about this. So what I want to do is I want to talk about industrial controls. So in industrial automation stuff. So we have been doing control circuits. That's fine and dandy. We've been studying all that stuff. Um, but like there's way more than relay control. So let's just jump into this. There are all different kinds of ways of looking at stuff. So let's take a look at some of these industrial compo control components. We have automated uh, automated control systems where we get this like PLC thing, and this is a safety PLC, and then this thing's called an HMI, and all these cool things. 
So we got motors and drivers and control and machine safety and temperature process, industrial components, and then all this is all safety stuff too. Um, and sensors and visions and code, like dude, this is, goes on and on and on. So I'm gonna go through all of this step by step. Um, again, I'm just teaching you some terminology. I'm opening your mind up to some amazing stuff. So let's let's see if I can. No, I can't do that. Um, let's just rock on. Okay. So in, industrial industrial expertise. So essentially, this list. I could make this list. I could put a hundred things in this list, and then I could just keep going. So. What's going on is that all of the industries that use automation, well, they go on and on and on. Like entertainment uses automation. Um, like the medical industry uses automation. Like even water and waste and stuff uses automation. Let me tell you a story about this. I'm going to tell you a story. I want to give you a, a sense of everything that's automated. Street lights are automated. Um, uh, like, you know, the, sorry, at the corner of the street lights are automated. Um, the mail delivery is automated. Everything's automated. I remember my friend, he, uh, Elliot, he, he jumped into some, some of the lectures and he's called me sometimes. Anyway, he works for Schneider Electric and he's a salesperson. I remember he told me, so I'm going out to PEI. I'm going out there for a couple of days to deal with a customer up there. Now, the only manufacturing they have in PEI, as far as I know, the only manufacturing that they have in PEI is um, like a cannery, fish cannery and, you know, lobster and stuff, whatever. And I was like, yeah, well, I guess maybe they have a PLC. But I'm like, what would they possibly use out there? Why would they need PLCs and HMIs out there? Like, you know, they just got a cannery out there. I mean, there's no industry manufacturing. Eh? Why would you need to go there? Just like I asked him that like an idiot. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, and he says to me, <laughs> looks at me like I got like, two heads. I'm like, it's like large. Sorry, are you an automation professor? Don't you? Anyway, I was just kind of joking around a little bit. We were having fun, but he said to me, he goes, Lars, do they have street lights in Prince Edward Island? I'm like, yeah. He goes, okay, do they have safety systems on that bridge? Yeah. Do they have security systems in Prince Edward Island? I'm like, yeah. He's like, do they have sewage treatment there? I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh. Do they have like water systems there where they're like putting water, like, you know, delivering water to people? I'm like, oh, yeah. And then he went on with a whole bunch of other things. And, and then I just I was like, OK, thank you, Elliot. Dude, automation is it everywhere. Machines that control things are all over the place in all kinds of industries. So um, that slide, it just like five different industries there. And, and this is press the button. I just want to make sure I'm in. Okay, good. So, yeah, automotive, food, beveraging, packaging, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's awesome, dude. Okay, good. So, where did I put it? Okay, good. So, packaging, semiconductors, all that. So, I mean, if you're interested in, like, what kind of job can I get with this? What industry can I go into? Yeah, well, I think I just answered that question. Semiconductor, security detection, water, solar, it's huge, dude. So this agricultural model, I'm not even going to bother teaching this. Stuff. I just right now, I just want to teach you guys some terminology and impress upon you that there are so many different um, things that are involved in automation. And it's just such a huge industry. So push buttons. These are inputs like this is we're going to talk about sensing all kinds of senses. These sense an event. The event in this case is somebody takes their finger and presses the button. Yeah, that's the event. So, and they have, they illuminate and they do all of these cool things and like they're, they're essentially, you know, you can control machines with them. Obviously, you know what a button is. Um, and then selector switches, we know about that. I mean, you're going to go for like, you know, choice one, choice two, choice three, blah, blah, blah. So this is machine, this is human interface, right? And then over here we have machine interface. So what's going on here is that this, these, all of these sensors here, which are limit switches, they're just normally open or normally closed switches, and they get hit by some mechanical thing, and it tells some kind of control circuit. Oh, by the way, um, this the the mechanical device has reached its limit, or it has reached this device. We call it a limit switch. So it's just a normal switch, and we can get them normally open or normally closed. And we have all different. Oh, dude, you have no idea the different types and flavors of limit switches. There are thousands of them. Basic switches, types. So this is another type of limit switch here, right? So, and they control all kinds of things. AC, DC loads, temperature application, positioning, end of travel. So essentially what's going on is something's moving back and forth. 
You want to know when it gets to the end. Or you may have this thing in between somewhere, in between the motion. And it's going to say to you, okay, you've reached halfway or something. So it's traveled halfway. So sensing technologies go on and on and on and on. And on. I mean, we just talked about push buttons. We talked about selector switches. And we talked about limit switches and basic switches. But oh, do you, is there more? Yeah. Are there more things? Yeah, a whole bunch, dude. So we have these really cool ultrasonic sensors. These things are awesome. Um, they actually tell you how far away something is and how far, like if it's getting closer or further away. These things are on cars. Proximity sensors, they're on cars too. These work, in, you can get inductive proximity sensors. You can get capacitive proximity sensors. You can get different kinds. You can light proximity sensors, photoelectric sensors, fiber optic sensors, um, uh, photo micro sensors, like all of these different things. So all of these different sensors exist. And um, you know, measurement sensors that they sense, and then vision sensors, vision systems are so cool. You're going to study vision systems in your third year. So all of these things, you're going to get an idea or a handle. At least all of you will get a handle of at least some of these. In your third year, some of you may do this, 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 but you're going to be touching on these things. So you got to know these, these terms. Um, so actuation technologies uh, down here. So proximity of the all proximity sensors. I just went on about them, dude. They just this, this is amazing. It goes on and on and on and on. Ultrasonic sensors, measurement sensors, vision systems, which are so cool. Um, yeah, RFID readers and stuff. So what? There was something I I slipped over, and that it was over. It was here. Why did I go? Actuator technologies. Dude, this slide slipped in. So I don't know. That word shouldn't be there. Um, so, and then uh, all different kinds of sensors and stuff like that. So, and then we've got control. So now, what's going on here? <laughs> Pardon me. Thank you. Um, control systems. Like, we've just been building basic control circuits. We've been building control with relays. It's like the most rudimentary control you can get. These are programmable logic controllers. You're going to take four courses in programmable logic controller if you're in electromechanical engineering. If you're in mechanical engineering, you're not going to need to take these, but I think you may, you'll be talking about them in their courses. But these are huge. These are all over all kinds of manufacturing industries and all kinds of automation industries, like sewage treatment uses this, water systems use this. The street lights that are controlled, like you know, they flash and the whatever, and they change, they change their cycle time depending on the day and the red and the green and the and all that, and the button where you the walk button and all that. That's all controlled by one of these things. Motion controllers, they control the motion of motors and actuators. Um, so you can get linear actuators that are kind of motors that go back and forth like this, or you can get motors that just turn and all different kinds of motors, which you will study in your next few courses. Um, these actually control the motors themselves. Position control, what it does is it kind of communicates with the motors, it, it can communicate, communicates with the motion control, it has sensor feedback, so it knows where to tell the motor controller to turn the motor so that it's in an exact position. Temperature controllers, we've already built our own temperature controllers using ladder logic and relays. Timers, we've already used some kind of timer in our ladder logic and relays, but you can actually get these digital things that you can program quite exactly. Counters, counters are really important. You want to know how many times something's come on and off. You want to know how many parts are going down an assembly line. You want to know a lot of stuff about how many power supplies, all different kinds of power supplies. Um, so these are in, in control. This is a big, huge thing. So motion controllers, like I said before, like I'm just kind of flying over this stuff because I want you to get, actually HMI is a word that you probably need to know. Human machine interface. What it is, is that's an HMI right there. It's like a screen that talks to the PLC and the whole system. And it shows you what's going on. It shows you what's happening. It shows you where the robot is placing and picking things up. It, it shows you whatever's on the vision system. It tells you what the IOs are doing in here. You can actually go in there and do some slight changing. You can control the system to some degree. You can make some settings. You can say, okay, you can go over here. Okay, make the parts blue now. And it'll like switch the system over so it sprays blue paint instead of green paint or something like that. 
um, safety systems. So all of these things are all of these things. So very, very cool. So uh, PLCs, programmable, programmable logic controllers, they're huge in industry. Position controls, like I said, temperature controls, they go on and on and on. Timers, you've already thought of, you've already seen and understood some applications of timers. Counters, like I said before, counting parts, counting how many times something comes on and off, any kind of event that happens, you have a counter, power supplies, and they're all different kinds of power supplies, depending on it's DC or AC or one phase or three phase or uh, all of this different stuff that you need to know about power supplies. And software is a big deal as well. Obviously, you know, but there are so many different kinds of software that are used to control all of this stuff. Like, like think, look about all these. Like, just go back up to this top slide. Look, you know how many, you know how complicated each one of these things is? Dude, there's a software for each of them. So, um, yeah, all of the different softwares. There's so many different softwares. So, I mean, I, I'm not even getting into all of the different softwares, but I will say one that's pretty cool. Um, it's a SCADA. So, a SCADA is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. It's kind of like an HMI. Remember that HMI was the human machine interface over here. So what's going on is the human machine interface, you, 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 can, you can watch the system and you can tell the system, you know what, paint it blue or paint it green. That's fine. An HMI, there's not a lot of control in an HMI, but it's more about monitoring and maybe making one setting or two setting changes. Supervisory control and data acquisition. Um, a SCADA system is kind of like an HMI, but it's a little bit more in, uh, in depth. Um, and you can actually make a lot more changes. So the supervisor can go in and make some more severe changes uh, to a SCADA system. Again, it's just the software. It's pretty amazing. So visualization, um, and then we've got this HMI here is the human machine interface, industrial panels, digital panels, pilot lights, so HMI interface, um, again, it shows you the images of the pictures and it, it has menus and all these things. You can go in and you can visualize everything that's going on and it gives you a kind of a report of what's happening. Industrial panels. What's going on here is there's actually a computer in here. It runs on Windows, actually. And it's a computer in here. And what this does is, this is like an HMI, but it's a little bit more controlled. So you can go in here and you can change the flow rate of all of this, or you can make some changes in here. But the thing is, this thing actually controls the whole process. It's a PLC, a programmable logic controller. It's not actually used to control the process. Um, there's actually a controller in here. Now, often these things talk to PLCs and together they make the, the control system. But this is very much like a, um, a SCADA system where you can make changes. Um, but you can really uh, monitor in detail what's going on in here. Digital panels, all kinds of readouts and stuff, which I think you've seen and you think makes sense to you. Pilot lights, turn them on and off. Actuation. So what's going on with actuation technology is that you got these things called drivers. A driver is a thing that controls some kind of motor. Um, and servo motor and drivers for motors, actuator, drive relays, and solid state relays. So I'm going to talk about this in a minute. I'm going to I'm going to tell you some cool things about solid state relays. But what's going on is that the word drive is in here. The word drive is here. The word drive is in here. When we talk about a controller or a device um, that's making something go, we say that it's driving it. Yeah, like it's driving it. So it's a term that we use. So um, you can even say, you know, this controller is driving this heater um, or this light or this motor or whatever. And often the word drive indicates a little bit more than just turning it on and turning it off. When you drive a car, you're controlling it, right? You can put a reverse forward, you can speed up, you can slow it down, you can steer it. You're dry. It's a whole process of control. So when we we're talking about drivers, they're actually controlling the devices that are going. And they're essentially actuators. They're motors and um, they're solenoids and they're things that physically move, right? So those are what we're driving those things. Also, you can drive, you could, you know, can, generally you could drive a system with a heater in it. I guess you could drive a heater, but it's generally not said. But if you said, you know, I'm driving this, I'm using this, uh, this controller to drive that heater, nobody's going to tell you that's wrong. They'd be like, well, Okay, so we usually we drive things that are actually physically going and moving and making 
actions, right? Um, and often they're more complicated systems that are all kind of integrated. We're driving that whole system. Okay, cool. So uh, that's the term driving. So AC drives, um, obviously what's going on is that um, you're, you're actually using these to actually drive motors that are AC. Here, we got servo drives for motors. So we're going to be driving servo motors. That You're going to be studying servo motors in another course. Um, and you'll understand a little bit more about them. But right now, it's just a different kind of motor. And um, you actually have to get these devices that know how to drive them. They're a little bit more complicated. You just can't run power to them, and then they go. Um, actuator drive relay. So what's going on here is that you were in the motor assignment. Essentially, you would have used these kinds of relays to control that motor for um, the forward and reverse uh, motion. Now, solid state relays are really cool. What's going on here is that the solid state relays, they can switch really quickly. And you can use very, very, very little current to make them go. Over here, I mean, that's a physically pretty big coil. That thing might draw like half an amp or two, 300 milliamps, like quite a bit. So um, depending on the voltage that you're using to, to run that coil, but it's a kind of a powerful coil. And the other thing is that there are these physical switches that go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you know that. You've seen the little contacts moving when you're in the lab. So there's a physical thing that's transferring its mechanical energy back and forth. It can only turn it on and off at a certain speed. Plus, you need a lot of power to make it switch. Solid state relays are different. You need very little current to make these run. You don't need a lot of power to make these change their state to an active state. So um, you can you can make them um, you can make them change their state with very little current and even low voltage. But the thing is, they switch really quickly. They're totally electronic. There are no moving parts in here. So you can make these things switch like tens of thousands of times a second over here. You can maybe make this switch 10 times a second, and it'll destroy it very quickly if you do. This, you could run it for 12 years, switching at 5,000 times a second, and it would be fine. It'd be just fine. So AC drivers, like I said, you're driving motors. You're driving a conveyor belt motor or a mixer motor, and it's actually driving it, and it's controlling the speed. It's turning it on and off. Servo motors are pretty cool. They're a different kind of motor, and you need a special drive for them. Uh, and the relays, they're going to turn the motors off. Like I said before, this is the type of relay that you would have used in that in the uh, the control circuit for the the uh, assignment that we did to control the motor and a solid state relays, which I just talked about. So safety is a big big system. Now let me just kind of pause in a sec for a sec. You guys have to think safety. Everything you design, whether it's mechanical or electrical or electronic or a motor or whatever, especially if it kind of has its own, not brain, but if it's automated. Even a mechanical system can be automated, which we will learn next semester in pneumatics. We are going to build entirely self-automated systems that don't use any electricity, don't use any relays. Don't use any kind of electrical anything. You could actually run them under water. And they are actually entirely mechanical systems that run on air pneumatics. Um, but what's going on is even when you're designing that, if it's automated, you have to think about safety. If it's a large or a big or a small or if it's a powerful thing or a high powered thing or if it's moving in any way, you've got to think about the fact that not only are other skilled people going to be using it? But other people who aren't skilled are going to be using it and or near it. So you have to pretty much make it, when you do your safety control, you have to make it what's called dummy proof. Like you pretty much have to make it so that if a dog walked in there, it wouldn't kill the dog. Now, we also have to remember that the stuff we're going to be working with in building, and designing, and maybe modifying or maintaining it actually has the ability to kill people. Yeah, kind of a heavy thought. But we have to actually, there's a certain amount of like integrity that we have to have. That we have to, we, there's an ethics to engineering, to any kind of engineering discipline where you have to understand the power of what, yeah, safety first. You have to understand the power of what you're doing. Like, Dude, if you're not responsible and you don't think about safety, you don't think about the other guy, and you're not constantly building your things 
to fail safely and to design them safely, somebody's going to die. Because that machine may be, may be going for another 10, 15 years. And thousands of people are going to interact with it. So anyway, so with all that said, um, keeping safety in mind, let's move on. And we will talk a little bit more about safety. And we'll jump in here. Dude, there's so many different things for safety. It's pretty cool. So what's going on here? Um, safety curtains are pretty cool. So what's going on is that it has these these light beams in between and you can't physically see them but if you put your anything in there like again like if the dog runs in there it'll shut down and it's instant it's instant the funny thing is is that there was one year that i mean we've actually kind of worked over this it actually happened more than once there were a couple times where these are in the robotics lab and um the robot actually ended up going outside the safety curtain and it stalled the robot but you couldn't use the robot would not turn back on so we couldn't get the robot to reverse out of the safety curtain so that it could allow the robot to come on because the robot wouldn't come on because it was in the safety curtain. It was like a catch 22. You had to actually um, disconnect the safety curtains and physically remove them to, and then like turn the system on and then off again. And we had to build a special thing to have these set so that they could see each other. It was ridiculous. It took us like, I don't know, it took us half a day. It was ridiculous. Um, anyway, so we've uh, since uh, kind of got a workaround there, and uh, we put a, a special system in there to override it. But even putting the override, dude, we had to, like, design an override system to override the safety system. The safety system is so integrated to the robotic system. Not only do you have to design your safety system in mind of, of people, you know, that are going to kill themselves, but you also have to design so people can't hack it. Yeah, we had to, like... I don't know, Anthony, which was the old tech guy, it took him a long time, but he did a workaround where he, he put this safety override, he had put an override system on the safety system inside the robot cabinet. And uh, I think he'd like locked it inside another box with a, like another key. So not, a, not, only, not even someone that had the key to open up the robot controller could go in and open up the safety override. So you see, it's really serious. Uh, anyway, here we go. So, um, so safety, and then we've got this, this, um, you know, laser scanners, and they can tell you what's going around. They put these in the back of trucks and pickup trucks and back in and, and, uh, garbage machines and backup trucks and in areas where there are, you know, things moving around a lot. And it can sense, you know, really stuff really far away. It's very much like LIDAR, actually. Uh, it can sense stuff really far away. And then if anything's moving, it knows. Safety rebates. These are pretty cool. There are a lot of redundant stuff. So you'll end up studying safety rebates if you're in electromechanical engineering in a big way. So safety rebates are these things that, like, kind of when they come on, they latch, and you have to kind of do a lot of stuff to kind of turn them off again. Uh, and that you have actually these things called safety controllers. So the, I mentioned a PLC, Programmable Logic Controller, which is a huge part of all kinds of control industries. They have their own, like, this is kind of a, like a little PLC that is designed specifically for safety. So there's like double redundancy in these things too. To, and whatever safety control system you put in here and it's next to impossible to hack it. You have, well, it's impossible. You want to make it to impossible to hack it or to, to I mean, nobody's going to hack a safety system, but um, you want to make it so nothing, even if you like, you know, damage the system, this is going to, this is going to still work. And not only that, if something goes wrong, this just locks down and shuts everything down. Safety mats are cool. So unless you're standing on the mat, a machine won't come on. Um, safety door switches. These are like limit switches, but they're saying, hey, you know what? I won't turn this machine on. You put, it, it puts an interlock in the situation where it will not turn the machine on uh, unless the door is closed. So limit switches, same thing. This would sense a door is either closed or if the door opened, it shut the machine off. And emergency stops are big things. So always put an emergency, always think about putting an emergency stop in for your operators to just hit. And you can put like these all over the place in any kind of system or any kind of place where there are people involved in an area um, where they're going to be uh, working with machines. There could be one guy 20 feet away and another guy, he's 20 feet away, whatever. And then they see someone else get damaged or hurt by a machine or they see a machine that's about to hurt somebody. They can just go over and whack one of these. So you put these all over the place. Um, and light curtains, which I talked about. So we just went through all of these things. Yeah, see on the back of trucks, we have these things. So this is like a warning zone, and we can put them in a robotic space. So if there's someone comes in here, that robot's going to stop. It's not going to hit anybody. 
safety relay relays these are pretty cool things so they kind of they, they lock down their latching as well so what they're automatically like you don't even put a holding circuit in there as soon as they energize they just stay that way safety controller so you have these whole things that is like it's a little plc that's a safety control and it works with the whole system it monitors all of the safety protocols that are going on in that system safety mats you know you're standing on it and and the machine won't work safety doors we talked about that limit switches same thing just like an elevator um that that elevator um if, if the limit switch uh you can put limit switches here so what's going on is that this is going to control the elevator itself it's not going to open the doors unless the elevator is in a very specific place emergency stops we talked about them they're all over the place so that's what's going on. The architectural model is all of this stuff in between, and then we can integrate it. So here are some cool examples about all of this. And then what I'm going to say is that let's take a look at this ladder logic and take a look. Where are the inputs? Where's the control aspect? Where are the outputs? And where's the safety? Now, this is a kind of a new symbol for you guys. This is called an e-stop. It's an emergency stop. Once you physically hit it, it becomes open, and the only way to close it again is physically pull it. So it's kind of a pretty serious kind of thing. It's on and off. Often these have keys in them. So once you hit them, you can't you can't disconnect. You can't put them back to their normal state with a key. Pretty cool. So what's going on here is that if we look, take a look at this, that's an input. It's a pressure switch. That's a temperature switch. It's an input. That's a start. It's an input. That's a stop. It's an input. The relays and the wires are the things that do the controlling. And the contacts, they do the controlling. The outputs are the heater and the solenoid and the mixer, another emergency stop. So we can see that it's okay to put emergency stop on things that are important. We can even put one here on the solenoid as well. So, um, so PLC implementation, what's going on is that, by the way, you guys maybe didn't know this, but we can put all of our ladder logic and we don't have to hook up any of these wires and we can build the whole thing with a PLC instead. We could build all of this. We could connect this input, that input, we can connect that input, we can connect that input all to a PLC. And then we connect this output, that output, and that output, and even these E stops to a PLC. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. That's right. So what's going on there is that when you were in the machine shop, um, you guys know all about those e-stops. And you know that there's a key there. I'm not sure if anybody ever pressed the e-stop during in your machine class. But if anyone ever did, you need a key to unpress it. So there you go. I wanted to kind of go over that stuff. And I wanted to highlight all that stuff. I wanted to give you all those names. I wanted to give you a bigger picture of what automation is all about and, the, and how detailed it is. Um, there you go. So you, you have a good understanding of all of that and the terminology. It's okay. I'm not going to test you on that stuff, but I think it was important that we just, we talked about it. Um, anyway, so I didn't want to talk about that until we ended this course, at the end of this course. Because if I told you the beginning of the course, you wouldn't understand the ladder logic. You wouldn't understand any of that. But now that you've got a good understanding of all of the terminology that we just used, I could talk to you about that stuff. Okay, good. So what I want to do now is... I want to go in and I want to show you some of this stuff here. So um, I did these industrial design projects. Here are some worksheets and there's actually some homework. Oh, there's a quiz here. No, make it unavailable. I don't want to stress you guys out anymore. Don't worry about the quiz. I just, I won't put it in the grading sheet. It's not, you don't see a quiz. It doesn't exist. Um, Industrial programming. So this is awesome, dude. I mean, I think I showed you this before. So um, an automated uh, cell example. So the concept, the, the, the term cell itself is kind of like the whole thing together. So if I go all the way down to the bottom, the final, the final project is the cell itself. It's like the whole automated process that's actually going on. So what's going on over here is that this is the this is the development of a control system for an autoclave. Autoclaves are cool things. I built one um, for um, my business partner. He works in um, in the medical industry, and he makes um, orthotics uh, and prosthetics and a lot of really cool stuff that goes on the body and bracing and uh, and, and braces. He made the braces that I wore on my legs actually, because my my feet 
have them. They don't work, actually. My legs don't work properly. I kind of walk a little bit funny. You guys haven't seen me walk. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So I really braced some of my legs. He made them. Um, Actually, the brace I'm wearing now were made in a machine that I built. It was pretty cool. So it doesn't matter. So the autoclave is this thing where you can put carbon fiber in it, and you, you, you run this vacuum pump. There's a vacuum pump. And you – there's the, sorry, there's the vacuum pump there, and there's the motor. So you run the vacuum pump, and you evacuate this area. You heat the area, um, and then actually you I – have, I don't have it in here, but you put um, a pressure – actually, there it is. You put a pressurized – thing in here um, so you have pressure and vacuum in here it's pretty cool so this is called an autoclave it's a really really cool machine so this is this is a whole explanation of how to go through the design process of actually designing an autoclave so I need you to like if you're hungry for this stuff dude like jump on this the design process is step by step first you do the autoclave and then you put a limit switch in and then you put your, um, your pneumatic control in and then from there, you put your heater in there. And then you put you put more aspects. So my point here is you do one step at a time. Don't try and do it all at once. Do one step and then the next step and then the next step and add stuff. Now, I've what I've done here is, as opposed to trying to make all of the ladder logic all at once, I'm taking each of my inputs and I'm driving it to my own relay to its own relay because I'm going to use this limit switch probably for more than one thing. I want to use this temperature for more than one thing. I want to use this pressure. I want to use this vacuum for more than one thing. So from that video that I talked about in lab five, there's a couple of videos there, and I walked you guys through the concept. Listen, think about your event. Think about how many things have to happen because of that event. If it's more than one thing, you're going to need to multiply that event with a relay. Because a relay has more than one contact. So in this particular situation, what we've got here is we've got, I'm putting each one of my, the, the sensors or switches that translate the event into an electrical impulse, I put into a relay so I can multiply. And then from there, I'm just adding a little bit more logic and a little bit more logic. And, and then after, what I do is I take all my inputs and I put, I put the, the logic together and I put it all together. Now, I'm not asking you to know how to do this or whatever. We'll walk. We'll do a lot more control design in, in industrial pneumatics, so we're good. I don't need to push any of this, any of this on you anymore. But you just have to kind of see the process. Okay. What's going on is that I could build this, and you know how to build these things. We we've done that in the lab. You know that this is a relay coil and that's a switch and you got to run the wires and you got to run wires over here and turn the heater on and do all this stuff. Lots of relays all over the place. Uh, and you got to wire all the relays. You know what? You could also just hook up this switch, that switch, this contact, that contact, this contact, and this contact. You don't even need this. You don't need that. You don't need this. You don't need any of these contacts. You don't even need these relays. All you do is hook up the inputs and the two outputs, and you wire them into these wires. These are the inputs, and these are the outputs. And then what happens um, is that you program this ladder logic into this thing, and you actually program it in ladder logic diagram. Like if this is a programming language that you program in here. You hook this thing up to a computer. This is software. And you program it. Now, this is a tiny, tiny little thing called a logo. It's a tiny little PLC, but it's a programmable logic controller. I could build all of this with relays, or I could just hook up the inputs and the outputs to this thing, and I could program this logic into here. So pretty cool stuff that's going on here. Yeah, uh-huh. Absolutely, Ian. So there's a program called RS Logics. That's absolutely right. And it's a type of programming language. Now, Siemens has a different kind of programming language, but RS Logics is an Allen Brat. Sorry, I'll say that. RS Logics is a programming, a programming language where you actually build ladder logic diagrams, and it's made by Allen Bradley. Allen Bradley is a big name in automation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue on here, and I'm going to jump in, and I'm going to show you guys one more example, and then I'm going to hit um, a, a review or ask some questions. So, dude, this is pretty cool. We've, you guys are experts at reverse control and motor control. Again, there, here's this challenge. 
try and figure out how to hook up this relay, how to put wires between this motor, that relay, that start uh, this power supply and this switch. So if you if you flip this switch this way, number two and one become connected. If you flip this switch this way, number two and one can become connected. If you let go of the switch, it jumps into the middle and number two is not connected with anything. So it's a single pole triple throw actually. Okay, so you've got to figure out how to hook all of these things up so that if I put it one way, the motor goes one way. If I let go, the motor stops. If I put it the other, the motor goes the other way. This is a 12 volt coil. It's a 12 volt motor and that's a 12 volt power source. And that's a hint if I say 12 volt, 12 volt, 12 volt. So that means that you can kind of do some cool wiring here and figure out how to actually do a reverse circuit with one relay, just one relay, and uh, one single pole. It's actually a single pole double throw with a, a center off. So it's not actually a triple throw, it's a center off. Uh, switch. Anyway, there you go. So now let's jump over to here and I want to talk to you guys about like something I thought would be cool to talk about, which is like a hot chocolate maker. Uh, and this is another design where we're going to use ladder logic and uh, oh, it's a PowerPoint. So let me just open it up. Excuse me. Slideshow from current slide. All right, industrial control, hot chocolate maker. So what we're going to do is when you, when you design this, you go through some steps. So I'm not going to go over all of this, but you've got to think in step one, you've got to think about the operational parameters. There's a term you should know, operational parameters, the parameters in which under it operates. So you got to think about ifs, ands, ors, whiles, nots. And I didn't put it in here, but you know that I've got this thing called a was, right? And you've got to think about the wases in here and stuff. Think about your logic. Just write it down. Draw yourself. Like it's like, you know, remember like in grade 11, 12 physics or whatever when you were studying that? And then they're like, okay, draw the picture. And then you can see the car going down the road. You can label the velocity and you can do all that stuff. Um, same thing. Draw the picture, and it gives you an idea of what's going on. Because then you'd be like, oh, I have to put components in. I have to put two motors. Oh, okay, right, and you get that. Draw the cell. Define the system, okay? So what's going on is that you have to say, okay, here's a filling system. Here's a, it's a here's here's an emptying system. Here's a filling system, and here's some kind of, like, other filling system, and there's a heating system here. So you've got to think about the leveling in here. you got to think about the heating, and you got to think about the liquid dispensing. So... Break it down into systems, and then you got to think about your IOs, inputs and outputs. So in this case, I've got a temperature sensor, I mean input. I've got a float switch, it's going to be an input. And, and um, my outputs are going to be my two motors, and there's some kind of solenoid here that drives this thing. And you got to think about all your inputs. So inputs, level switch, start switch, oh yeah, start switch, I totally forgot about that. Outputs. Fill pump, motor, and the other one's heater. Oh, there's low alarm, high temp alarm. So we got to make sure that put some alarms in here. You got to think about all of this. So uh, again, IOs, more of these things. So you've got to think about all of the inputs and outputs. For there's a process of design. So discuss choices. If this, what are the different things that you could do? And then you've got to design your ladder diagram for each. So that's for the heating. And then there's another one for, oh, no, no, no. You, do a, you do a ladder diagram. Oh, stop that. You do a ladder diagram for the leveling, and then one for the heating, and then another one for the liquid dispensing. So the reason I told you to split these up into three or four or two or 12 or whatever, break your system down. Design a control system for one, and then another, and then another. And then what you do, is once you think about controlling each one, then you try and integrate all of those control systems into maybe one bigger controller that controls all three of them, or maybe do some kind of handoff. Okay, so when the leveling is done, we have to hand that off to the heater. And then once the heater is done, we have to hand that off to the dispensing system. So in that the dispensing system shouldn't happen unless the heater's already done what it's designed to do. Anyway, there we go. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, bye to everybody that's watching.